Okay, so this is our 1.5 part one. Uh, we are going to spend three parts on this section. Really important sections here. Some of it will be easy, some of it uh, maybe a little bit more challenging for you. Uh, but we are going to go through this and make sure that we understand where we're at with functions and the different parts of functions. A lot of this stuff is just brushed over a little bit in Algebra 2 and Algebra 1, and we're getting into more of the deeper uh, understanding of what functions are and making sure that you understand them. So the essential question is what types of information do graphs of functions give us? And then we're also going to be learning that we're going to, or we're going to be using graphs of functions to estimate function values, uh, domains and ranges, which we've done quite a bit of, going back to y-intercepts and zeros, which we did, uh, which you've done a lot before. So let's start with uh, looking at a graph. And again, you may have to follow a little bit on your paper here to see uh, some of this stuff because I know that my the camera and my picture is covering some of it. But in the example, it says a function f of x equals negative 5x squared plus 50x approximates, uh, approximates the profit a toy company uh, get makes, the profit of a toy company, where x represents marketing costs and f of x represents profit. Both costs and profits are measured in tens of thousands of dollars. Use the graph to estimate the profit when the marketing costs are 30000 And then we are supposed to confirm our estimate uh, algebraically. So what we're looking at here is basically the one thing that we want to make sure we're clear on is understanding first of all that everything that we see in our graph here is in tens of thousands of dollars. So when you see a 2 that means $20,000 because you're multiplying the 10,000 by the 2. Up here profit is in ten, tens of thousands of dollars so when we get to 50 we would have to do 50 times $10,000 to know what the actual profit is going to be. So in this case it wants to know, estimate the profit when the marketing costs are $30,000. So what we need to be able to do is figure out, well, first of all, where does that $30,000 come in on our graph? So, so basically, we're looking at, sorry about that, a little malfunction there. So basically, we're looking at here, we're on our x uh, axis, our marketing, if it's $30,000, then that's going to be where the 3 is. So if we look at where the three is, we go up on the graph, and you can see maybe not so much on your paper, but from right here, we're not quite at the 100. We're not quite at the 100. So, I mean, it looks like we're going by 25, so we could try and estimate where that's going to be. I mean, maybe it's 105, maybe it's 110. Um, you know, let's try 110. So we're going we're gonna to go with it's 110. But keep in mind, we want the profit in, in dollars, so we need to take this $110 and multiply by the 10,000. And when you multiply by 10,000, you get a profit, at least the estimated profit would be $1,100,000. Now we want to check this algebraically. Well, we simply do that by plugging our 3 into our equation. So we want to know what f of 3 is going to equal. So f of 3 will equal negative 5 times 3 squared plus 50 times 3. And then when we put that in the calculator, we actually get 105. So again, we need to multiply that by our $10,000 because it's $10,000 for every unit that's on here. And we get $1,050,000. So actually, the estimate of 105 would have been more correct, as you can see from that. But again, you can see that you can use a graph to estimate information, and then you can also check it algebraically because we've learned enough in algebra to know how to do these things algebraically. But we want to be able to understand how to interpret a graph, look at a graph, and then use algebra also if needed to solve. Okay, let's do another example, and we're just going to do it in the opposite direction here. So it says use the graph to estimate the marketing cost when the profit is $1,250,000. So we're going to confirm this algebraically again. So what do we need to do here? Well, first of all, we need to change this back to units. So if we know it's $10,000 for every for every unit, then we need to actually take our $1,250,000 and we need to divide by 10,000 to figure out how many units we're going to go over here. And that's going to be 125 units. So when we go up to 125, which is right here, you can see that our x value is just about right here. So it looks like that's going to be at 5. So if our x value is going to be equal to 5, then that is going to equate to $50,000 in marketing costs. And if we wanted to check this algebraically, 
we do this. We go, we take the 125 because that's what our equation is in, is in, is in these single units, okay? Not in the total amount of dollars. So we take this 125 and set it equal to our equation. And then we solve. And we solve by turning it into a quadratic. We subtract 125 from both sides. And we get 0 equals negative 5x squared plus 50x minus 125. And now we need to factor. So we always want to find a common factor first. So we pull out a negative 5, which will leave us with x squared minus 10x. Uh, plus 25, and then we keep factoring from there. x minus 5, x minus 5, and remember that was all set equal to 0, so based on what we have here, x is equal to 5, we have confirmed what we have right there. Okay, so you can do it again algebraically, and then you can do it graphically. Okay, this third one, I want you to do on your own. So you're given some information here. Uh, obviously, let's see if I can move this back to where it's supposed to be. Got a little mixed up there. Okay, this is supposed to probably be over here, but that's okay. Here's our function. We're going to just put it down here so you can see it. Okay, so you have negative 0.32x to the third. So on your paper, it's hard to see. It is p of x equals negative 0.32x to the third plus 1.5x squared plus 22. So there's your function. I want you to read this, do it on your own, answer the question, let's see how you do it. Okay, so your estimate, who knows, your estimate could have been anything. Maybe it wasn't 25, but my estimate was 25. Uh, and then when I plugged in the value, I got an exact value of 25.52. Obviously, your estimate would not be 25.52, but if it's anywhere close, maybe you said 26, maybe you said 25.5. I mean, who knows? I mean, your estimate is your own, but you should be in the general area of 25.52, okay? So let's move on. So this is uh, looking and in, in interpreting a graph and being able to estimate values and use algebra to get exact values. Now let's get into domain and range, which is really important. It's probably is the most confused uh, topic, and we really, really need to get solid on this. So when we do domain and range, Hopefully you remember that domain is your possible x values. So anytime you see an arrow going in one direction, even though it looks like the arrow is going down, it also means that the arrow is going to the left. So if the arrow is continuously going to the left, then clearly our domain is going to start at negative infinity. And we're going to do interval notation with this still. And if you follow this, the x value is going to the right, all the way to the right. Notice there's no arrow on this side, and there's this closed dot at 1, 2, 3. So therefore, the domain is going all the way until 3, and because it's a closed dot, it's going to be included. It's going to be a bracket. So there's our domain. For our range, our range, again, because of our arrow going straight down, our range is going to start at negative infinity, and it's going to go all the way up. And notice the highest point that it gets to is, looks like 2 here. So the highest point that it gets to is 2, So and it's included because it touches it. If we label that as 1 and 2, so therefore it's from negative infinity to positive 2. So using your graph, you should be able to pretty easily figure out what your domains and ranges are based on what x values are being touched and what y values are being touched. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Okay, this one's a little bit more difficult. This is a piecewise function, but I still want you to look at it exactly the same way. So we have our domain. Our domain start on the left. There's no arrow. So it's starting at, looks like negative 1, negative 2, and then negative 3. But negative 3 is not included. So automatically we start at a parentheses negative 3. And what do we go to? Well, we go all the way to 1. And 1 is included. So 1 is included. And then we jump down here, and then we keep going with this arrow going to the right. So because 1 was included already, we don't really need to jump anywhere. We know that 1's included, and then it just continues on to the right, so we can just write infinity. Okay, there's no gaps there. Even though there's a gap with the y values, does not mean there's a gap with the x values. 1 is included, and then it continues on to infinity. Now the range becomes a little bit more dicey. See, we have our range going all the way down, so we can certainly 
start at negative infinity if we need to. That should be pretty easy. But what does it go up to? It, do, it goes up to this negative 1, and that is not included because it has the open circle. But there's this gap here. So the tendency for some people might say, oh, it goes all the way to 1. But it really doesn't because we have this gap here between negative 1 and positive 1. So we've got this line taken care of for our range. But what we now need to do is identify this line right here, which is just 1. So if it's a single value and that's it, there's no other value besides y equals 1 there, we will just say bracket 1, comma, 1 bracket. That is representative of saying that 1 is defined and only 1 is defined there. And then obviously we have our negative infinity, comma, negative 1 to define the rest of it. So that's a little bit more difficult, but again, you need to take the gaps in the graph into account. We cannot include the gaps in the graph as part of our range because they're not part of our function or part of our graph. Okay, so that's a little bit about domain and range. Okay, let's move on to y and x-intercept. So this first one, it says use the graph to approximate the y-intercept, then find it algebraically. Well, keep in mind, we want a y-intercept. Okay, y-intercept, that means the y-axis. So real easily to estimate, there's our y-intercept, one, two, three, four. So y equals four is what we're using the graph for. Now algebraically, what do we do algebraically? Well, what we just need is we just need to figure out what our x value is. And our x value for every y-intercept, no matter what, the x value will always be zero. So what we do is we plug in zero into our function, zero squared minus four times zero plus four gives us f of zero equals four, same answer, y-intercept is four. Hopefully that's pretty easy. Y-intercept should be very easy. Okay, last example. Let's talk about x-intercepts now. So x-intercepts, again, if we look at them graph graphically, pretty easy to find here. Looks like we have one at negative 1, we have one at 0, and we have one at positive 1. So x equals negative 1, x equals 0, x equals positive 1. But now we want to show how we do that algebraically. Well, again, our y value is 0 at these points. So if our y value is 0, then we can just simply set our function equal to 0 and then solve. So we're going to factor this. We have a common factor of x with x squared minus 1 left over. And then we can factor this quadratic to be x plus 1 x minus 1, that's a difference of squares, and now we can state what our values are. x equals 0, x equals negative 1, and x equals positive 1. And that matches with the x-intercepts that we found up there. Again, it's a skill that we need to be able to do. We need to be able to factor. We need to be able to set things equal to 0 and solve using various methods. And we also need to be able to find things like the y-intercept, like what we did on the previous problem. So three things in this section. We did interpreting graphs and, and uh, substituting values in for, for a function to solve. We found domains and ranges, and then we found y-intercepts and x-intercepts uh, graphically and algebraically. So that's all I have. Uh, I will see you in class. Uh, I hope this makes sense. Bring any questions that you have to class.